Sharks. Welcome, 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 and welcome to another edition of Hockey 24-7, brought to you by Raider Media. It's me, Derek Alberts, and with me as always, Tyron Jabu Barnard. I don't know why, Tyron, but it feels like it's been a while since we've done this, but I know why. It's because it's been a while since we've done this in the studio. Yeah, absolutely. And the studio has uh, come on leaps and bounds. The, the walls have been painted. The roof is up. The sound uh, checks have been put in place uh, because, you know, the big budget is rolling in now. So we're spending. Yeah, it certainly does help. So thanks very much to all our very, very kind sponsors for uh, letting us uh, get the podcast uh, go from strength to strength. And also a big, big thank you to, uh, to our various guests that we've had along the way. We've had some big names. We, we've had some big names. I, I think before we dive into the names, should we quickly uh, thank all the sponsors individually? Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that list is growing, I promise you. Although, we must say a big, big thank you to Spa because they are a massive player yeah, in absolutely. the hockey game in South Africa and were instrumental in, in getting us uh, on down to Durban for the indoor uh, hockey series. Yeah, so Spa for the indoor series and then we're in talks with them for more work. Um, obviously, uh, super group for the, the launch that allowed us to chat to a bunch of the players. And then just the brands who've gotten and shared it and, and the players who've shared it because that, that growth is uh, what gets us to carry on doing this. Yeah, there's no question that the players certainly uh, keep things rolling along. And without the players, uh, we wouldn't exist. And uh, South Africa wouldn't exist on, on the hockey forefront, given the fact that they are that good. Speaking of good players, boy, do we have a big name tonight. Yeah, yeah, we try to get uh, some bigger names, but we had to settle in the end. Um, no, tonight, tonight we're not messing about. Tonight we're not pulling punches. Tonight we're uh, taking arguably the biggest name uh, in the active hockey community in South Africa right now, and that's none other than Austin Smith. Whoa, Austin Smith. I mean, if you don't know a thing about hockey you'll still know that name. Uh, joining us on the line, we're privileged to have you here. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining us finally. It's taken a while, but uh, geez, it's been worth every single second of waiting. Yeah, good evening, guys. Well, yeah, it's evening over here in the Netherlands. So, yeah, thanks very much, uh, both of you, for having me on the show. Yeah, you say in the Netherlands, uh, that's become, I'd say, your second home. It's almost your first home. Uh, you you spent quite a bit of time over there. Yeah, well, I've even bought a home, so it feels, <laughs> at the moment, it feels uh, that much uh, more like home at the moment. Uh, my girlfriend and I decided that we would call it home for at least the next five years while we both get a bit of uh, work experience. So, yeah, it is uh, it is home for now. Yeah, and, and maybe then I think it's a good time that, uh, you know, we have a lot of Dutch listeners. Um, well, actually, I have no idea how many Dutch listeners that we have. But just in case we do... <laughs> I know that you're quite fluent there. Would you like to uh, give the Dutch listeners uh, a bit of a, a local greeting? Oh, that's how I graag do. Uh, for all Brabanders, then say I, uh, yeah, goedemiddag and how do for struck. You know what's great is Derek can't even speak Afrikaans. Um, sorry for outing you like that, Derek, but uh, he has no idea what you just said. So we could talk about Derek. And Afrikaans and I can next Vietnam. Yeah, it is not all too much to talk, but it can a bit for Stan. My, my ah. Afrikaans has improved in leaps and bounds, but uh, but my Dutch is still very rusty. I was actually in South America earlier this year, and I was with uh, one of the Dakar drivers for Toyota Gazoo Racing South Africa, a brilliant Dutchman uh, called Bernard in Brinker, and I was interviewing him, and then we switched over to Dutch, and. I said, okay, cool, now, now we're going to do Dutch. He goes, oh, okay. And, and he expected, obviously, me to speak Dutch. So I said, guten duken daken dieken daken. <laughs> he was offended, eh? He was very, very offended. I don't, you, you must never, ever read <laughs> the Dutch language. Or most languages. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fair enough. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Austin, you, you don't have as many embarrassing stories on a hockey field <laughs> As Derek has next to a sports field. Uh, no, not on a hockey field, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's where we should start, on the hockey field. Uh, yeah, you've got a career that, uh, if we go through all the highlights, uh, this will not just be hockey 24-7, it'll be hockey 365. But uh, no, that was quite a good one. <laughs> I thought about that on the spot. But, uh, you know, your career has spanned so many big things. Your, your time in England, your time in Holland, obviously Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games. Is there one specific thing that stands out as the pinnacle highlight in your career? 
Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's uh, it's mixed between uh, a few. I think uh, I can still remember the first day uh, uh, I received an email from Paul Revington uh, saying that I was being invited to a national camp uh, where I would play my first cap. I can still remember coming home from university and receiving that. So that was a huge moment. And then the other one that sits right up close. Uh, to that is being selected to go to the 2008 Beijing Olympics. And yeah, that was something that I literally dreamed of since I was 11, 12 years old. And to finally get there and to walk out in the bird's nest in front of that many people, yeah, that was really the moment that I thought, wow, I don't think anything could be any better than this. And and comparing your two Olympic game experiences, I mean, you got Beijing in 2008, you got London in 2012, you should have had uh, Rio in 2016. We'll digress into that a bit later. But um, <laughs> if you compare the two experiences, not from a hockey point of view, but an overall experience, Beijing or London? Uh, I think London, purely from a hockey uh, spectator perspective, uh, yeah, the, the stadiums are full at both venues. But I mean, yeah, to give you an example, there were times when the ball would go into the goal just randomly, like a ball that had gone through from the halfway line and 10,000 Chinese people were ecstatic and then suddenly you heard some Chinese on the, uh, over the intercom and then the English translation of uh, for a goal to be scored an attacker must <laughs> touch the ball inside the circle and you hear the whole crowd go oh, oh, oh. oh that's, so that's yeah crazy. the English crowd were I thought uh, very knowledgeable uh, really just respectful for good hockey so to play in front of a stadium like that when people uh, cheer tactical things uh, that was also uh, quite fun I can also imagine that the fact that it was your first Olympics over in Beijing, that, that would have also marked it a, a, a very special time. Yeah, it was, also, it was special, but on the other hand, you also so, yeah, you're almost so overcome by the, the moment and being at the Olympics as a youngster, yeah, people forget how uh, big that moment is for players. And the problem I... Uh, the mistake that I made as a junior is that I kind of set this goal of going to the Olympics and then I got there and then I was at the Olympics and then I realized, oh, maybe my goal should have been to uh, be the best player at the Olympics or to win more games at the Olympics. I think that's a, a fault that a lot of our junior players, uh, myself included, make. Uh, you set uh, almost limiting goals of just trying to make the Olympics instead of trying to uh, break into the top 10 at the Olympics, which is something that our country has never done. So, yeah, any juniors who are listening to set that as your goal, not just to go to the Olympics. We need to have to get to win, uh, win medals, not just compete. Austin, I- I've got a pub, and I've had so, so many sporting memorabilia uh, adorn the walls and uh, the desk, etc., the bar counter, and none of which are mine. Well, well very few are mine. And I, I always chat to former players, etc., cetera, to, to give me a bunch of their memorabilia. And I've been lucky enough to, to collect quite a, a nice stash along the way. But I always think to myself, if players have achieved so much, do, do they? Do, does that stuff take pride of place in their own homes? So do you have mementos from your, your two Olympic experiences so far? <laughs> I almost wish my girlfriend, I think I'll have to tell her to, to listen to this podcast afterwards because there's a lot, a lot of my memorabilia has been banished to the junk room. <laughs> <laughs> so we, yeah, we have we have two problems that we're both uh, both hockey players. So we've got a lot of uh, knickknacks from where we've been and old shirts. So there's there's not enough space in in a small Dutch house to to put them up everywhere. But uh, I do have one uh, little collage in the in the laundry room that that's been allowed to stay up there. So mm-hmm. when I go and do the laundry, which is mostly my job, I uh, get to see my my London memorabilia. The laundry room. <laughs> Well, look, yeah, look, in the laundry would, room. Yeah, every Dutch house has a I, laundry room. I would, <laughs> no, I can't believe that it's there. It, it, it would be in the, my front door uh, for people that arrive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I understand this because uh, I too, I got married and I, I have a bunch of sports shirts that uh, I've been given over the years from uh, from sports people that I admire and fans of or, or stuff. Um, one of them is actually from Austin, from Den Bosch. A good number five shirt. Yeah. Um, And I've got these shirts framed and uh, my wife said, cool. When we moved in together, she said, cool, now you can put them up in the lounge. Then it was, you can put them in the spare lounge. 
Now the spare lounge is Callum's playroom. She's like, you can put them in the <laughs> garage. Um, and pretty sure I'm, I think she's like, no, you need to get an office at work and take everything to work and put them up there. So it's gonna it's gonna be the boot of your car next. Yeah, I just think uh, you know. If I'm allowed one shirt to be up there, it should still at least be Austin's. Uh, I think so. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. At least the Dutch people are very direct, so they don't mess about. They don't lure you in with the, with the hope of it being allowed or not. They just say it straight, how it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, listen, Dutch, Dutch are, are absolutely fantastic. And, you know, obviously, Dutch, the Dutch are essentially, or at least their league is essentially the premier hockey league in the world. You've now played there for the last couple of years. What's what's it been like playing in the one hockey league around the world that's really, you know, and and I don't mean any disrespect to any anyone else, but that is week in week out playing the top players in the world. Yeah, there's uh, there's that that you're playing top players uh, against top playing with top players every week, but it's also the fact that you train at an incredibly high intensity. Okay, yeah, we train four times a week uh, on the pitch, uh, five times a week, sorry, on the pitch and with a game on Sunday. And I think that's the biggest difference that makes uh, in your game, especially coming from South Africa, where we train maybe two or three times a week to train at a higher intensity more frequently. Uh, gives you a far better chance to then arrive at a tournament where you're then training twice a day as a national team. So even just if you look at uh, how we expect players' bodies to adapt to training that much, uh, coming off the back of two or three trainings a week, uh, that's a huge difference. Uh, all the other things like playing in a huge stadium, like in the Boss, we have a 2,000 full-seater stadium that's covered. Uh, it's not always full, but uh, yeah, at big games, we have uh, around 1,000 people watching. Uh, to have uh, hockey newspapers, to have a uh, completely uh, up-to-date uh, hockey app with all the news, the transfers, the signings. Just being a part of that community uh, makes it feel like uh, you're uh, an elite sportsman. So that's, uh, yeah, that's special. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> you've been there for a fair amount of time with Den Bosch, who don't have the didn't have the most glowing um history in terms of winning the competition year in year out you know um what's it been like being at a, a a club who you know almost all the time are breaking the boundaries and and getting better and getting closer and i mean last year if i'm correct you finished just outside the playoffs um you know what's that like? oh sorry Ty, can you repeat that i think we just cut out there for yeah, a moment no worries. Um, so I was saying, you know, you, you've been at Den Bosch, who are a club who are not notorious for winning the Wolf the Class every year. Um, but Well, no, the, the men aren't. The women are. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> not the men yet. But <laughs> last year, you, you just missed out on the semifinals. Um, you know, how, how's that feeling about going forward? What is the, the, the goals the team are setting for the new year? Is top four the goal? Is getting into EHL the goal? Or are they very happy with the current uh, current scenario? No, yeah. <laughs> Unless you're winning uh, in Holland, it's a little bit like the, the Premier League. The the coaches come and go pretty quickly if you're not uh, at the top. So everyone expects to be winning and that's definitely everyone's goal and that's certainly my goal since uh, day one. Next year will be my 11th season with Zimbos. And yeah, I've had, I've had the opportunity to maybe uh, play in some other countries and in some other teams in the Netherlands, but yeah, it's been my dream to... Uh, be loyal to them both and to reach the top four and hopefully win the whole plus uh, and play in the EHL uh, with yeah what I consider now to be my club. That's uh, far more special, I think, than uh, hopping over somewhere else and joining a team that's already there. We've made great progress the last five years. We've kept uh, the majority of our team together. We have a fantastic coach in uh, Eric Verboom. And yeah, this coming season, we've only, we've only lost one player, an Argentinian player, so our roster stays pretty much the same. So I think that sets us up uh, with a good opportunity for the coming uh, season. So yeah, training starts on Thursday, the 1st of August. We've got six weeks of uh, preparation until I think the 12th of September when we start. So yeah, we're giving ourselves every every chance. And I mean, you guys, uh, if I look at the table, you missed out on the top four by just three points last year. Yeah, just three points. It was the first time, at least, we were playing the last game of the season. We needed uh, we needed Amsterdam. Yeah, I needed Justin Reed Ross to do me a favor and to lose or draw against Pinnacle, and we needed to beat Oranje Road. 
uh, they ended up winning 3-2 and we ended up drawing. So we didn't even take care of our own business. But it was really exciting to play the last game of the season. And I think there were still three or four teams who could have finished in that fourth place and make the playoffs. So that was a, a real uh, good step in the right direction. And I mean, obviously, you, you brought them up there. Uh uh, Rania Rett, there's uh, obviously yourselves, there's Amsterdam, there's Kampong. Who's who's the grudge match? Who's the match that gets your blood the most flowing? I mean, we know for South Africa, it's when we play Egypt. But in, in Holland, for Den Bosch, which team is it that really gets things going for you? Yeah, I haven't, maybe because I'm not, I haven't been part of the history for as long as some of the other guys, but Aranya Road, the guys really seem to get wound up when we play against Aranya Road. Obviously, it's a, yeah, it's considered a local derby. It's in the province of Brabant. Uh, so that really gets the uh, guys worked up. They, uh, they want to beat, uh, the Aranya Road guys. Uh, they've been ranked above us for the past, ooh, yeah, since I've been here, I think they've been ranked above us. So there's always, uh, that element of uh, trying to get one over on a team who's uh, on paper better than us. But for me, yeah, I haven't got anyone really that I think, ooh, those guys are really going to get it this Sunday. <laughs> you said that uh, you had the one Argentine leaving the squad. Was that Joaquin? Joaquin. No, uh, no, Joachim uh, Manini, we call him, uh, yeah, his nickname is Pancho. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, even when you say his first name, I'm always like, <laughs> I often think, like, who is that? <laughs> but, yeah, Pancho, Pancho is staying. Uh, Nico De La Torre is going to play for Leuven in Belgium uh, this season. So he's, uh, he's the player that's the only player that's leaving us. Okay, so you keep Pancho. So it's nice. Uh, at least you've still got one other Southern Hemisphere guy in your squad that you can kind of chat to. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, his English is really good. Uh, I'm glad he's staying because Nico's English, uh, uh, as much as he tried, he really, uh, he really struggled. Um, but Pancho is, uh, he's staying on. Actually, I trained with uh, him and Tim Drummond this morning at Timbalt. Tim came down and we had a little uh, stick session on the surf. So, yeah, that was uh, good to be out with him. Yeah, really nice guy, really, uh, really friendly. So, yeah, the, the Southern Hemisphere connection is there. Well, and, and mentioning some Drummond, there there is a host of players, South Africans playing over there. Not a, not a lot in the Hoofde Klasse, but a lot playing in in some of the other leagues. Is there quite a, a concerted effort to for the South African guys to get together and train together where possible? I know it's it's not easy. Yeah, where that's <laughs> that's the trick. The where possible. I mean, we had a South African training camp around the same time that. Uh, the rest of the guys trained leading up to the World Camp, uh, World Cup. We got guys uh, like Rhett and the guys in Germany came over. The guys from Belgium came over. We stayed yeah, mostly at my house and at a friend's house. And uh, eight of us trained and we played a practice match. So we do try and get those together to find time when everyone's coaches are willing to let players uh, out of training to, for guys to get time off work. It's it's quite tricky and it, revol- it requires a lot of training, but there was such a great energy when we got together. It feels even more special when you have to uh, work to, to get together and to see each other in a foreign country Yeah, it makes it all that worthwhile. So, yeah, I hope, definitely hope to, to do that again this season. I think, Austin, you're about six foot, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something like that. If uh, and I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the Netherlands, on average, has the tallest people on earth. Uh, do you do you do you feel it when you're walking around or even playing with the guys? Uh, yeah, there are some teams. Amsterdam, for example, where Justin Reed Ross plays. There are a lot of really tall uh, players there. But the, the time I notice it the most is when I've uh, been overseas, like in India, for example, when we're there for World Cup, or when I've been there for hockey in the league, and I come back. And then I suddenly just, like my eye level, I can almost consciously feel my eye level having to go up a few inches to uh, look at everyone in the eye. So yeah, as I land back in Schiphol, uh, there's a sudden reality of, okay, yeah, I'm back in the Netherlands now. Yeah, you know, Austin, you, you brought up Hockey India League and then, you know, it's quite fascinating because if we just talk through through your career, there's so many different things that have happened. Um, you know, we haven't even spoken about when you played in the Under-21 World Cup. But let's go to the Hockey India League. Hockey India League came about and it was supposed to be uh, the dawn of a new era for for hockey. And in the first couple of years, it felt like it might be. What was the experience like being in those inaugural inaugural squads? And of course, for yourself, uh, being on the end of a, a winning team at the end of the tournament. Yeah, that was uh, that was an incredible... They talk about like the advertising for India. They always talk about incredible India. And that was... 
really an incredible experience. There are there were so many highlights, things like playing with alongside Indian players and traveling with Indian players and living uh, in hotels together for six weeks. Yeah, six weeks doesn't feel like a long time, but wow, it's, <laughs> it's a long time. So getting to know the culture, something that like, and we, we had traveled to India many times before, but you're there with the South African team and it's kind of business and getting results. So you don't really take in everything, but now suddenly a tournament like this, it's a little bit more relaxed and you get a chance to really get to know uh, the players and they are, yeah, one of the friendliest, most welcoming uh, nations that I've been to. And the other part is playing alongside internationals that you have been playing against almost your whole life. And now suddenly you're in a team uh, with all these different guys. It's also really cool because we were lucky at Ranchi in our first year where Greg Clark was the coach. We had, I think, out of the 10 foreigners, we had eight nationalities and a lot of teams had just kind of picked seven Australians and uh, two Dutch players and a Spanish guy. So we had a really good mix and that made it even more enjoyable. And I, I can still think back to some of the discussions that we had when we were talking about our press or penalty corner. And then Mo first was like, yeah, no, this is how the Germans do it. And then Flores A was like, yeah, but the Dutch guys, we do it like this. And then Mo was chirping, yeah, but you didn't even win the World Cup doing that. And then we have Ashley Jackson saying, yeah, but this is what we're doing. And uh, Justin and I kind of just stood there and thought, well, We'll just we'll just let the big <laughs> the big names discuss it and then let us know what's going to happen. <laughs> Austin, I'm, but it was uh, it was great there. I, I've been to India from a cricketing perspective, and if ever I've heard the cliche that sport is a religion uh, used anywhere else other than Indian cricket, then I say, no, that, that's certainly not the case. You haven't been to India for cricket. I mean, the, the fans live, eat and breathe the sport. Yet, hockey is their, um, their, their premier sport. Uh, what's, what's the word? Their official sport. Uh, their national sport, sorry. And, I mean, is there still a, a, a crazy fan base? I mean, did you feel it uh, everywhere you went? Um, certainly when we played at Ranchi. It felt like uh, Ranchi is, yeah, almost almost a village, but yeah, it's obviously 10, between 10 and 30 million strong. So yeah, I don't know if you can still consider that a village. It's, it's very rural. But when we played there and when we played the final uh, was also held there. I mean, there were, the stadium was so full that there were people on the surrounding houses, on the roof. People were climbing trees outside the vicinity just to try and get a view. And you you just come onto the field and everyone goes absolutely crazy. And when we when we won that first uh, competition, I don't think I've ever heard a crowd go so crazy. It took us like an hour to get back to the hotel because everyone had just completely lined the streets. The bus was having to like inch forward. Security, yeah, the Indian security is uh, they're quite rough. So they just they just get out there with their sticks and they just start uh, waving sticks around whatever they need to do to clear the way for the bus. But uh, these supporters didn't really care what happened because they just wanted to see the guys in the bus. And just one wave uh, to the supporters was enough to uh, to keep them happy. So it was uh, it was incredibly special to be involved in something like that and to have the crowd supporting you instead of uh, supporting the Indian team. You know, normally we're there with South Africa. It was, uh, it was a nice change to hear that support for you instead of uh, just for the Indian team. I mean, it, it's... It's unbelievable when you think about hockey as a sport, and, and the fact is, it's still seen by so many, unfortunately, as a second-rate sport. It, it falls behind cricket, soccer, netball, right now, um, and and rugby. But when you see the crowds, I mean, when you see at the World Cup, twenty thousand people watching hockey, and it's not even India playing, uh, it, it's sensational. And and just for a bit of context, in in the third season, uh, when you won it for the second time, us and. Uh, your your mate Lloyd Norris Jones, good old Chuck, uh, who's been he was actually our first ever guest on the podcast, and he was very proud that he got that ahead of you. Um, yeah, so he should be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he he won hero goal of the match twice in the tournament, and each time he was given goal of the match, he was paid five and a half thousand rand. So twenty five thousand yeah. rand, five and a half thousand rand. Austin, how many times have you been paid five and a half thousand rand? playing hockey in South Africa. Yeah, well, certainly not for South Africa. My bank account seems to be going down to her at, at a rate of not at the moment. But, uh, yeah, to get incentives like that, it doesn't surprise me with uh, Chuck being the, the kind of player and the special things that he could uh, always produce. I'm not surprised that he 
uh, picked up a couple of those. I managed to get one uh, myself, and uh, yeah, I didn't realize quite what the exchange rate was. Uh, I originally thought I'd got 500 rand, so I thought, oh, that's, that's quite nice, you know, I can uh, go out for dinner. And when I realized there was an extra zero on the end of that, I was, uh, I was a lot happier with my goal. I think I may would have uh, asked the coach to take a four, few more of those flicks <laughs> that I know and uh, what the financial reward was. Yeah, forget Mo first, though. Who's he? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, I mean... It would be remiss not to talk about it, but uh, you know you've been around the national team now for over a decade, um, and in that time, financial struggles have probably been the biggest stumbling block for the progress of hockey in our country. I mean, we know you're still involved, but I think it's it's fairly common knowledge that players are basically paying to represent themselves, and you are flying back from Europe on your own account regularly to represent the country. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's sadly the state uh, that we're in. And I think, yeah, currently it's uh, financially it's probably the most uh, difficult that it's, uh, that I've ever experienced. Uh, yeah, to put it into picture, but yeah, these, yeah, that's just a fact what it is. The World Cup, uh, this Africa Cup and IPT are yeah, going to cost me in the region of between like 50 and 70 grand. And okay. yeah, it's, it's no uh, no small chunk of change that you have to try and come up with uh, often at the uh, at the last minute. So yeah, it's, it's difficult at the moment. Yeah. And yet, Austin, I think that's where massive credit goes to you. Is it has cost you a fortune to represent your country, but you've re- never refused a call up. Uh, you've never stood down from serving, and th- and that's why you know when you go to a pro series indoor, the name Mo Furster, the name Robert Tiggers, they're popular. But the kids go crazy for Austin Smith. And I think, you know, that's, you know, I, I can say it as your friend, but I can say it more honestly as, as a hockey fan. I think uh, South Africans over the years have come to really appreciate the efforts that you've put in. Um, and, you know, I don't think they've always uh, comprehended how much it's actually costing to represent your country. So, you know, from, from our side, I suppose all we can say is at least thank you for your dedication to the country. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of you just say. That. It's obviously, uh, yeah, the <laughs> the Dutch guys often. I don't even think they fully believe that we have to pay. I think they always just think I'm making it up. Um, but they, yeah, they often say, "Yeah, well, why do you why do you do it? You know, like, uh, how can you take that much time off work, and how can you afford all that?" Um, but yeah, like every uh, kid in South Africa would tell you, I think they would probably give us their entire pocket money or savings or toys if they could ever play uh, for South Africa and even at the age of 34 you still have that feeling of I would probably do anything if I could play uh, at another tournament at another major event like the Olympics uh, at an Africa Cup in my home uh, province yeah you probably would give up anything to be able to do that so uh, yeah that's that's still the case even uh, at the ripe old age of 34 gone on to represent South Africa many, many times. And not only that, uh, wearing the armband, uh, even more so. Um, something that, that you thoroughly enjoyed, no doubt. Uh, not doing it anymore, but uh, w- could could you return to the captaincy, Austin? Uh, I don't see myself uh, captaining the side in the future, no. We've got, uh, we've got Tim is doing a fantastic job. We've got uh, other guys coming up. Uh, Keenan is a uh, one of the vice captains at the moment who I think are all in a great position uh, to to lead the team. And I'm really enjoying my role now. Almost, I feel myself more like in the advisory uh, capacity that every now and again they'll say, oh, what do you think about this Aussie? Or uh, I may chat to Spring and say, oh, what about this one idea? Uh, and so, yeah, sometimes they agree and sometimes I don't, they don't, but that's okay. And I can focus a little bit more on, uh, on playing and trying to... Uh, give my best performance out on the field and it's, yeah sometimes it's quite nice not to know everything that's happening uh, behind the scenes because yeah trust me uh, Tim and uh, when Rusty is leading the team and Keena there's a lot of extra baggage that comes with the uh, uh, national captain it's not just doing I think some people just think oh you get to wear the armband and you do the coin toss it's job done you know <laughs> but there's uh, there's a heck of a lot that uh, like all our management have to do uh, a lot of thankless work so yeah, it's, it's it's no easy task. Yeah, and and Austin, if I'm correct, you actually captain South Africa on 99 occasions. 
So uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, ninety nine occasions, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> some people think that it would be extra special to get to a hundred. But uh, no, captaincy is uh, it's an honor when you uh, captain your country, and there's no there's no freebies like to get people to an extra milestone or whatever <laughs> the case could be. Uh, I mean, I agree with that. But uh, Tim, when you listen to this, you know, if if Austin decides he's going to retire one day, his last game. You should pass the armband over for, just saying. <laughs> so does it still count as a as a captain's cap if you just have the armband on for the last yeah. few seconds of yeah, the game? If you if you do the toss, <laughs> if you do the toss, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, they do that in football. They have ceremonial captains. I've seen. I remember Ashley Cole uh, not too long ago. Mm. Uh, he was playing his his one hundredth game for England, and he was made captain. And he said he would do it ah. under the proviso that he doesn't have to speak to the media because he famously ah. hates the media. And they said, okay, cool, no worries. All right. So he was captain on the day, officially. But, I mean, he, he didn't say a word to his players, didn't speak to the media. He simply wore the armband. He was marked on the team sheet as captain, but that was as far as his <laughs> captaincy role extended to. I, I can't see you All right, yeah. I'm not sure you can shirk all the, all the responsibilities. <laughs> I think if you're going to do it, then you need to do a, a full job. Yeah, Absolutely. Ozzy, uh, you're also uh, you've now been named in the the squad for the African Championships. With all the retirements going around, you are the highest kept player in the team. Um, your age is still young because Roger Federer made Wimbledon final at 37, so you've got years on your side still. Yeah, um, that's what I keep telling all these guys over here as well. <laughs> yeah, if as long as Roger keeps doing it, he's prolonging all all sportsmen's careers around the world. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that are hanging on to his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's making me feel ridiculous for my own retirement right now. But um, yeah, so I mean, you're sitting there 165 about caps. You're coming to the African Cup. It's 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 quite a quite an interesting time in South African men's hockey because for the first time in quite a while, we've moved up in the rankings. We had a great FIH hockey series final that that we'll chat about now. Is there a different kind of pressure that comes around when you are the most capped player in the team? Uh, I'm not sure if there's uh, if that is necessarily a different kind of pressure. I definitely I feel the pressure to be honest every single time I go out there because I feel like uh, as a senior player, uh, people are watching on TV. If you're playing locally, like we will be for Africa, people are expecting uh, the Austin Smith that they've uh, seen. Uh, uh, clips on Instagram, you know, when you flick a hundred clips and then one goes in the top right corner and you post that one. Yeah, well, people people want to see that the first time when they come to watch you play. <laughs> I can remember doing a clinic once and someone said, oh, yeah, uh, Austin, we've seen you uh, flick uh, bottom left, uh, top left, bottom right, bottom right in a row. And I was like, well, y- yeah, it, it was in a row on Instagram. It wasn't in a row when I did it, you know. <laughs> that took a while. I was like, oh, well, maybe you could show the kids how to do that today. Like, yeah. Uh, that, that, Thanks, mate. <laughs> that was how I once auditioned for a provincial team. I took about a hundred <laughs> uh, penalty strokes, and I was trying to show that I could hit the crossbar five times in a row. I hit it five times in the hundred. <laughs> Cut the clip. Yeah, exactly. But uh, the pressure, the pressure is mostly there from myself because uh, I want to, I want to be the best every time I go out there. I want people to uh, see me play and think, yeah, this guy, he's still on it, even though he's uh, slightly older than the rest. Uh, he's still uh, desperate to win, and he's been preparing well, and uh, he's really someone who deserves to be there, not just because he's the most capped or whatever the case. He hasn't retired, you know. I'd hate to someone to look at me and think, oh, this guy's just trying to. Uh, cruise along for the end uh, the rest of his career i really uh, feel the pressure every time i go out there to to perform well austin tyron alluded to it a little earlier we've got to go into it now um the fih series finals uh man uh, the the start that you guys had against the usa and japan um to, to say it started off badly is an understatement. Um, to get to where it got to <laughs> was phenomenal but uh, yeah not the greatest of starts over in in india no, not the not the greatest of starts. Although not overly surprising, this is yeah, this is often the case with our side. We we rock up at these tournaments completely unprepared, and we introduce ourselves uh, to one another. And once we know each other's names, and we get out on the field, then it takes two or three games to get going, and then we uh, start making some connections. And that was yeah, that was largely the case in India. And yeah, then we can just thank our lucky stars that. 
all the cross ball playoffs and everything worked out in our favor and we uh, and we got the result that we needed but yeah it's certainly a stressful moment for everyone who was spectating uh, watching from home and my parents who were there as well I think it was 40 degrees over there but I think they were sweating even more than uh, than was necessary <laughs> Yeah, I just going through the results. So you open against the USA, losing that one 2-0. Same scoreline against Japan going down there. And then, as you said, by then, you'd obviously met your teammates and they seemed like hell of a nice guys. You worked <laughs> out uh, the training regime and the tactics and then you went on to, to hammer Mexico 6-0. You beat Russia 2-1. And then you faced the USA in the semifinals. Now, this was an extremely significant um, match. Uh, just explain why again. In terms of the grand yeah, scheme well, of things, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, uh, Sascock had uh, mentioned that we needed to make top two at this uh, at this event to have any chance of uh, being selected to go to the uh, to the Olympics. So, yeah, this is there was almost the same as an Africa Cup final. Uh, yeah, a lot of people didn't really understand that, and I can under I can personally understand that because it wasn't clear, and we didn't. People then thought, okay, well, have you qualified for the Olympics? I said, no, we haven't actually qualified, but we've just met some of the criteria. So yeah, you could. It was noticeable also to me on the field that a lot of players were incredibly nervous uh, for that game, and yeah, that's what <laughs> that what makes sport interesting, and that's what the challenge is to play and to perform even when you are under pressure and you are nervous. You, yeah, you need to get that under control and. Uh, and perform so that's uh, that was uh, that was really special that we were met, able to do that. Yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. You, you played the Yanks in the semis. Um, America opened uh, the scoring, and then they equalised through. Uh, try and try. Can you guess who the scorer was? Uh, did I score the first one or the second one? I think the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the first one. <laughs> yeah, because Spoon scored the second one with about two seconds on the clock, didn't he? Talk us through that goal. Uh, which one? The, f- the first one or the second one? The, the second one for me was a little bit more impressive. Talk, talk us through both. Yeah, well, the corner we had... Uh, I've actually spoken to Rusty about it. We were talking about penalty corner attack and defense in the room and what we were going to do and what we thought that uh, America would do and what he thought that the keeper would do. And he had mentioned a few times, he says, this, this guy really comes out and he, he has a small jump before he, uh, he, before he uh, take, like, receives the corner. Like, it is an idea to push it straight down his legs. Uh, yeah, Rusty, but if I flick it straight and you don't score, then you just look like you flick badly. So, no, come on, Ozzy. So I thought, well, let's, I'm just going to bang this as hard as I can straight down the middle. And then hopefully <laughs> Rusty was correct on the on his analysis of the keeper. Yeah, and unfortunately it worked out. It didn't look like I'd uh, fawned it down the middle and cracked under the pressure. But I think if you see, saw my reaction, that you could see how uh, elated I was <laughs> that it that it worked. And uh, the second one, yeah, the second one. I don't think many people appreciate. I don't even know if it was visible on TV. That Spoons received that ball, and uh, Nick Spooner received that ball. I played that ball to him on the inside in our own half, and he went upfield. He hit a perfect. Uh, flat back stick, a long ball. I'm not sure who received it uh, up high. And then he sprinted about 45 meters, which, yeah, the chance that he was going to get that ball back was pretty small. And just, yeah, just an incredible lesson of getting uh, getting plays ahead of the ball. And the fact that he made uh, made the distance and then uh, finished it in the way that he did, playing it almost uh, behind him was uh, was world class. Like, I think that the, the best part of that move was his 50-yard run, which I think most people probably don't even realize. But uh, if that is on TV, uh, yeah, I really suggest people have a look at that because that was, uh, that was, for me, the most special special part of it. Spoon scoring with seconds left to, to give you guys the 2-1 victory. Now, Tyron and I were following the match, jeez, uh, 24-7, or the, the tournament 24-7, and, and we'd been following the match especially, and, and we'd been chatting to each other on WhatsApp uh, as each minute t- uh, ticked by. And uh, I got this voice note from him immediately after Spoon scored. Come on! <laughs> yes, man! <laughs> he was uh, happy. That's quality. Let, let's hear that's it again. Brilliant. Let's hear it again. Come on! Yes, man! He, 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 cut out, that's brilliant. he cut out the next words, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> they can't be played here. But, you know, Ozzy, I think that's that's... It was almost a, a release of emotion because I think, you know, I've I've been writing about hockey in South Africa for nine years now. Um, 
I've followed the story. I've I've seen how close we've been so often. And this just felt like, you know, old South Africa hockey, we would have tripped up at that game. Been so close, had the opportunities. But something clicked that hard, that, that run by spoons. Uh, you know, the, the stars aligned and, yeah, there we go. Get into the final and, and the release of emotion. And, you know, I was, I'm was i on another hockey WhatsApp group here in the country and I can tell you <laughs> there were people posting that they're getting strange looks at work because they're screaming. Um, <laughs> you know, people were just so encouraged by it. And I think there, there's another important aspect of that is hockey has a massive following in our country. Yeah, yeah, and it is special, and it's good that we celebrate uh, these special moments. And yeah, it's strange because some people in the know think, yeah, USA, that's uh, who the heck are they in uh, field hockey? But that team, I saw that team play here in the Netherlands. They were in the Netherlands for two or three weeks before the World Cup, and they played against club sides here, and they beat them, a good club sides. They lost 4-2 to the Netherlands, to the full Dutch international side. Uh, that team is well was well prepared. And uh, if you take 30, 40 uh, fit individuals who can play a bit of hockey and you train them day in and out, you can turn those guys into a, a world-class team. And that USA team, although you know, their rankings may, uh, may say otherwise, that was a good team. And uh, beating them was, uh, was, a really, was a really great result. And yeah, sometimes uh, we undermine the fact that we, yeah, we beat these uh, technically lower ranked teams but uh, there's a lot of money being put into some of these teams and uh, to beat them uh, means a lot so yeah I'm glad people were excited when we beat USA I think you can see by our reaction that we were excited too I was going to say, you, you mentioned that there are a lot of teams that put a lot of money into their endeavors across the sporting world and, and you speak about you know who the hell are the USA, I always think that the Americans in any sport are always going to be competitive I mean we know the base that they come from we know they are arguably the strongest sporting nation on earth we've seen how they've climbed the ranks on the uh, rugby seven circuit and I think from a South African perspective when it comes to rugby in general from the 15 man game we can be very thankful that the Americans haven't cottoned onto that just yet because uh, they could very well be a powerhouse there so I, I, I don't think it's necessarily an underdog when you play America in any uh, sport. And as you mentioned, the guys are fit, they can play hockey, and they've got some cash behind them, which uh, makes them doubly strong, if not more so. Yeah, and they've also actually got, surprisingly, a lot of their players are playing in uh, in good European clubs. So they, they don't lack uh, the knowledge either, and they've got some, uh, there's a few players there who are world-class players. I mean, you didn't, yeah, you may not have noticed all the time, but like guys like Pat Harris, who's playing, uh, played with Red Halkett actually at uh, Mannheim. Uh, he's won the German uh, German league, and that is a that is a world class player that adds uh, a lot of value. So yeah, no uh, no mean feat. Yeah, and and I also think you know those of us that know, um, and if I have actually admitted it themselves, is the the ranking system in hockey is archaic. Um, it's not a true reflection of most teams. Because, unfortunately, tournaments from up to 10 years ago can still factor in. Now, 10 years ago, the players playing, I mean, some of the players playing for South Africa now, 10 years ago, were still wearing darpies, uh, were still wearing nappies. I mean, Tyson Lingwana, um <laughs> we're interviewing. Yeah, Tyson there's Lingwana. some, uh, <laughs> when, I, when I look at some of the ages of like, how old guys were when I made my debut, then I do feel, <laughs> I do feel pretty old. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, you made your debut, it's 2004. Um, 2004, yeah, that was some time ago. Oh, I mean, in 2004, no, let's not throw Derek under the bus now. Um, <laughs> he was completing matric for the seventh, eighth uh, time? No, it would have been fourth. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, while, while we've got you, uh, uh, I, I figured we should ask you a few quick fire questions. Now, the answer to these questions can be anything it doesn't have to be hockey related uh just whatever comes to mind all right so what is your favorite city in the world cape town obviously yeah bit of bias there uh what's the best gift you've ever received Ooh. Oof. 
Some, yeah, probably a ca- camera. My first camera, actually, that was pretty special. Receiving that uh, from my from my siblings for my birthday. Yeah, they were able to. Yeah, before camera phones, all the kids out there. Yeah, before camera <laughs> phones were around, you actually needed a camera to take a photo. That was uh, that was a special moment. Uh, was it one that you needed film for? No, I'm not. I'm not quite that old. <laughs> but it did look almost the size of a brick. So yeah, it was. It, was, it certainly didn't fit in my pocket. No. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, if we opened your fridge, what is something that we would always see in your fridge? Ooh, Wait, peanut. Uh, not peanut butter. Um, strawberry jam. I put put it in my yogurt. Put it on my toast. Put it in the croissants. Everything. Okay, your favorite movie. Shawshank Redemption. I've watched that about 20 times and it was on two days ago, so that immediately sprung to mind. <laughs> and what is your go-to karaoke song? Go-to? Sure. I don't even know if I've ever done karaoke before. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> Challenge accepted, yeah. Maybe the, isn't the Proclaimers just saying uh, I could walk 500 miles? I don't yeah. even know the, I don't yeah. even know the lyrics yeah, of that, but it's it. just such a, I could just, I could just imagine myself Thinking oh. to that, if I if I knew all the words, and then uh, now let's let's uh, do it. Uh, do a little bit of a, a dishing of dirt on on the people you've played with over your career. So it can be South Africans, can be club mates there, Den Bosch or from Ranchi or from Reading or wherever it is. But uh, of all the teammates you've ever had and all the roommates you've ever had on tour, who's the most untidy? Ooh. This is tricky because I am probably the most tidy. So anyone I room with, I immediately have to lay down the law. But right, this is how it's going to be. I mean, recently I've been rooming with Kino and he, he already knows that everything needs to be neat and tidy, at least in the shared area. But the most untidy. Hmm. I feel like I need to, yeah, Justin, Justin wasn't ideal. We roomed together for a long time uh, in India together in six weeks. Although the fact that he brought his own aero uh, press and could make amazing coffee completely countered that because, yeah, the, the amount of good coffee that you get in India is limited. So I don't really feel like I could mention uh, mention his name there. Maybe Marvin Harper. He wasn't great either, actually. I played with him, uh, roomed with him uh, at the World Cup. 2010, I think. He also wasn't great. Great roomy, but but messy. It interests me. You say when you explain to them prior, this is how it's going to be. I mean, what do you tell them? I mean, is it are you a complete neat freak? I mean, do they have to have everything packed away, or just not be a filthy pig? Well, yeah, it needs to all be packed away. (laughs) Need to. Uh, well, to be fair, it just has to be away. So if they want to just throw it all in the cupboard and I can't see it, then that's also okay. I, I, but I, I feel like if we're going to have meetings, and especially when I was captain, we had a lot of team meetings and things in uh, in my room. So it needed to it needed to be welcoming, and I wanted people to feel like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, this is quite spacious because having eighteen guys in a room is already tricky. So if you've got stuff sprawling all over the place, then it makes it feel that much more cramped. So I think that's probably added to the the craziness my my business partner ray him and i travel a, a lot together and we we often share rooms and if you had to ask him i mean this is obviously uh, apart from sporting years and stuff like that and if you had to ask him who's the worst person you've ever roomed with he'll definitely say me and if you had to ask me i'd definitely say ray so you can imagine how <laughs> bad our room is uh, you, you wouldn't last two seconds there, i'm afraid no shame. I could uh, imagine that being a tricky, and I give uh, even at home. Yeah, I give my I give my girlfriend a tough time with packing things away. I get in a lot of trouble when we're when we're cooking. She's the she's the boss when it comes to cooking, and we, when I pack things away before she's finished using them, then I'm normally in a bit of a bit of trouble. So I have to sometimes just calm myself down. That works. All right. So let's uh, let's wrap up the hockey questions with uh, one more. You are playing in a, a uh, the EHL final. Um, and you get a choice that goes down to a shootout. You get a choice of any five players you've played with in your career lining up to take those five uh, shootouts. You have to take number five, so you can only pick a number f- another four. Who would they be? Who would, who would be your go-to mm. go-to players? Yeah, but obviously have to start with uh, Mo first. So obviously, he would just do the yeah. turn, the German turn, and that would be banker 1-0 also because 
yeah, he's one of the best players in the world and super confident. So you'd want him to get you off, uh, get you off the mark. Another player who I played with, um, uh, Lucas, uh, Lucas, what is his surname? Argentinian player, Lucas Ray. No, not Lucas Ray. Can't think of his surname now, but he played at Den Bosch for half a season and he was incredibly silky. Played right back, uh, but just had all the moves of a strike. I don't know. He was wasted at right back, in my opinion, but he was, he was awesome and he was a brilliant, uh, shoot that taker. So I think I'd have him in there. Uh, and then I think we need a South African and probably our best shoot out taker, Diane Kasim. Also, a youngster, he has no fear. I would back him uh, every day of the week to score a shootout. And number four, maybe uh, maybe a Dutch player like uh, oh yeah, Billy Bucker would uh, would be my number four. Four, also a big guy, easy to block the keeper. I would back him, and then I would just come in with a straight slap at number five and the game hopefully <laughs> uh, well maybe you don't have to take it because who would be your keeper ooh who would be my keeper the Spanish keeper Kika Cortez is a is a good shootout keeper yeah and yeah I think I would put him in goal as well yeah he's also he also talks a lot I think he gets in the mind of the shootout taker so I'm not sure if he's better as a keeper than everyone else or he's just got more uh, better chat that uh, it definitely plays a part there you know it's banter for the win banter for the win yeah well <laughs> anything for the win to be honest <laughs> <laughs> all right Oster, I, I mean we're gonna wrap this up uh, in the next few minutes uh, you still gotta take part on a, in a, a very important part of the the podcast but before we get there uh, do you want to give any any sort of uh, thanks to you I mean, I know you're a very proud uh, man for your sponsors, but, uh, you know, the guys who kind of help you make sure everything ticks. Yeah, well, actually, God, it was uh, Princesses in South Africa, their 10-year anniversary a little while back, so I definitely need to give them uh, a shout-out and uh, to thank them for bringing me on board when they did, when they were first starting out. Uh, that was a uh, yeah, that was a really special moment to uh, to go with a yeah an unknown brand in South Africa, and for the way that they've yeah looked after me. A lot of people just think that brands are important for what they give you, but I think brands are more important for how they support you. And uh, Jack Tonneson and Princess have really done a lot to uh, support me and to support my family, often uh, financially, but also just. Uh, being there for me uh, when uh, not everyone uh, uh, was so yeah that's uh, that's meant a lot to me and yeah all the people that uh, have supported me and uh, helped me along the way yeah I'm uh, hugely grateful to to all those people because yeah as a hockey player you do need a big uh, base around you to to get you to all these events and to get you through the tough losses uh, and to be there when you're celebrating so yeah all those people really mean a lot to me Austin Tyron mentioned that there's an integral part of the Hockey 24-7 quiz that uh, we don't end off without uh, visiting this part of the show. Um, It's the one-question quiz. It's one question, very, very easy, kind of. And it usually... (laughs) It's it's related somehow to the person in question, and usually to do it their name, and because your surname and still- usually completely impossible because I listen to your shows <laughs> on the way to uh, as a podcast on the way I, when I drive to school, and I often think, oh, here comes this moment when they say it's related, and then it completely isn't related. <laughs> well, well it, it's it's often has to do with their name, and because Smith is such a unique surname, it was so tough yes, to find yeah. someone with it. But we, we went the maths route. Yeah. Because uh, I was a big fan of uh, William Smith growing up. Ah, William Smith, yes, yeah. I don't think most people listening to this podcast will know, but uh, I remember him. What, yeah, what? I wish I'd paid more attention, to be honest, because I'm trying to teach math now, and I think, yeah, sure, I could have paid more attention to old William. Well, Just you smarties. Well, if, if, if those that are listening know what you're talking about when you spoke about cameras and not cell phones, then uh, those are the ones that uh, will know who William Smith is. <laughs> interesting, yes. interesting bit of trivia, though. Because remember, William Smith used to co-host a TV show with Jeremy Mansfield back in the day called A Word or Two. 
Ja, vaguely. It was um, a, a maths and English Olympiad type competition and they'd have guests on the show and William Smith would uh, deal with the maths side of things and uh, then they'd have like a, a, an English side of things as well. And then you had contestants. Our very own Tyron Jobby Barnard was a contestant. Uh, how old were you, Tyron? It was in the early teen years. So early teen years. How so old? 13, 14. 13, 14. And he made it to the final. Yeah. Oh, wow. And Do we have video footage of this? That would be I, amazing I, you, to see. YouTube didn't exist back then. Uh, and, and also, although I don't have the deepest voice in the world, it was a lot more high-pitched back then. <laughs> <laughs> the, the balls had, had far from dropped. and uh, but, 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 but you just, just missed out right at the end on the, the conundrum. Uh, on a conundrum that was a sporting conundrum. The clue was years and years of cricket, and the answer was centuries. Yes. And to this day, when someone scores a century, oh, I cringe. <laughs> oh, man, heartbreaking. Um, okay, mm. so let's let's get to that question, Orson. We're going to bring in William Smith uh, with a mathematical uh, question, which is <laughs> bringing in rugby also. Um, are you familiar with your, your rugby terms at all? Uh, yeah, I can still barely remember them. We don't. I don't see too much rugby on TV anymore here in the Netherlands, but uh, I okay. hear some scores every now and again. Okay. <laughs> this should be fairly easy. Um, what is the total that you get if you add up the jersey numbers of the hooker, the scrum off? Oh, I'm I'm already lost. <laughs> and, and the inside centre. Four. I don't even know the numbers. I'm, so, I'm to be. I'm 100 percent honest. I'm not even sure where all these players <laughs> play. That's uh, how limited my rugby um, knowledge is. I'm, I'm going to go with the guess, though. Okay, so okay, it's, oh, it's let's ob- go with the guess. Okay, it's obviously going to be a, a double figure score. Yes, I'm going to go with 22. Yeah, it's not far. Jeez, you were close. You're very close. So, so because you were so close, you were out by one. Yeah, it's 23. Um, because you were so close. Oh. I, I have another question for you. That, that, that relates <laughs> also to, completely related no, to my no, name. This one relates completely to your hockey career. And, and I okay. know you're, a, for lack of a better word, you are a little bit of a hockey nerd. So, Ozzy, how many Olympic goals have you scored? Oh, one in London and in Beijing. Uh, stick side low, stick side medium high, rebound. Oh, and against China, glove side low. So how many was that then? Four, five. And that's where the A5 stick came from, right? Wow. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, Kuhar. I guess, yeah, Olympic goals are a little bit easier to uh, remember than uh, rugby players' yeah, numbers on the yeah. show. <laughs> I'll be honest, though. We've asked similar questions to previous guests about their own careers. You'll say, can you remember who scored in that game? And someone will be like, or like a Marcel Keith will be like, it was Kate Woods. It was definitely Kate Woods. I definitely remember we won that game. You, know, you lost that one, 1-0. No one scored. Or Marcel, you scored a hat-trick. Oh, <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, well, I, either that means that they scored too many goals that they can't even remember, or they won too many games and it's not special <laughs> anymore. But uh, the Olympic goals, I can remember all where they went, how I felt, uh, what I did afterwards. I can remember everything about all of those goals. We, we're sitting in our studio and we're surrounded by all my sporting books. Uh, I've got hundreds of them. And one of them, uh, well, many of them are uh, essay Sporting the Cricket Year. Um, so the, the official SA Cricket uh, 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 alumni cricketing book. And um, I'll never forget going to the launch of it uh, a couple of years back. And I sat down and at my table was uh, a former player who played for the Proteus. And um, he was still playing at the time. So he's sitting down and he says to me, I've got a question for you. So I said, yeah, he goes, who has scored the most runs in a calendar year, three years running? So I said, uh, and I said, no, I don't know, Jacques Callas. He goes, nope. So I said, no, I have no idea. And he, he opened it, the book, to like page 165. He didn't even have to flip through. He had it there marked down. And he pointed to his, <laughs> to his own name. So, so <laughs> he, he, he's a type uh, of guy. He knows exactly. He, he wouldn't pull a muscle kit. <laughs> he, he'd pull it. Oh, God. Sport. Derek, can you guess <laughs> who was the first ever South African hockey captain to captain the team to two World Cups? 
That would be our man on the line. There we go. Austin, thanks very ah. much. Austin, it's been so great thanks chatting to you. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Ty. Well, it's good. And, and see you in Stellenbosch. Yeah, yeah. I hope uh, to see both of you. Are you going to be down, Derek? Yeah, I uh, think so. I'm not too sure. Uh, <laughs> probably, probably. Uh, when is it? <laughs> it's in August. Yes, I'll try and be there. <laughs> Perfect. I, I well, will be there. we'll see you in person. Uh, in person, there. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, great uh, to reminisce over some of the some of the old stories. Thank you. Cheers, yeah, and awesome. Bye. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye.